Welcome to the YouTube channel about electrode boilers. Today, I'll show and talk about the heating system installation developed by the German engineer Albert Tischelmann. This system is also called the Tischelmann system. What are the advantages and how does this system work? Let's first look at the common two-pipe system, which is found almost everywhere in all heating systems. What are the connection options and what are their pros and cons? Let's take a look at the first installation scheme. Every system has a heating boiler and radiators are placed around the entire perimeter of the house. Let's start with the exit. This pipe carries hot coolant out of the boiler, passes through all the radiators in turn, reaches the last one and then loops back. And through the second pipe, the cooled coolant, collecting the return from all the radiators, heads back to the boiler. Most often in this installation system, the supply and return pipes are 25 mm in diameter, and the heaters are directly connected by a 20 mm diameter pipe. Well, let's take a closer look at how this heating system works. The heated coolant leaves the boiler, goes through a pipe to the first radiator. The radiator heats up completely, and then the cooled coolant returns to the boiler through the inlet. So, this radiator is the first in the supply, and the first in the return. It is in the best condition, has the strongest supply and the strongest return. Then the coolant goes to the second radiator. It heats up in the same way and then the cooled coolant returns back to the boiler. So this radiator is second on the supply and second on the return. It also has sufficiently good working conditions. This way, it seems we have everything to supply the radiators up to the last one which is 9th on the supply and 9th on the return. This radiator has the toughest working conditions, the weakest supply and the poorest return. If we use this diagram to start the system with all valves open, we get something like this. The first radiator will turn on at 100%, the second at about 85%, the third at 65%, the fourth at 40% and the fifth at 10% and the rest of the radiators will most likely never turn on by themselves. Of course, every house is different. The length of the pipes also varies. The number of sections is different too. So for some, such a system may work a bit better, for others, a bit worse. However, in any case, to get all the radiators working and heating up, we'll need to artificially create resistance for the coolant in the first few radiators, using balancing valves. After their adjustment, the situation will look as follows. The first heater will reheat to 100%, the second to 95%, the third to 90% and so on until the last heater. However, it must be remembered that several of the last heaters never exceeded 60% of their heating power. And of course, the last radiator will heat up the worst of all. Such a system has another flaw. Let's assume that it's too hot in a room and we've decided to reduce the radiator's power or turn it off completely. However, this will affect the operation of other radiators. If we reduce the power, they will start to heat up a bit better. If we increase the return again, other radiators start to heat poorly again. Such a system can of course be improved. For example, you can increase the diameter of supply and return pipes. It's also possible to compensate for the power loss of the last few radiators by adding sections to each. This will certainly lead to an increase in the system's cost, but even so, that part of the heaters will never fully work for us. In this way, we get the fact that one half of the system is artificially constricted, while the other half cannot fully start up and function normally. Well, from a hydraulic perspective, it's not too good for the boiler itself the circulation pump or the heating system as a whole. The second connection option. Let's look at the second option for connecting these radiators in a two-pipe system. So, the supply comes out of the boiler and is connected to the distributor for two exits. After the manifold, one pipe is connected to these radiators and the other pipe is connected to these radiators. In the same way, the return is connected through a double distributor. As a result of such a connection, we get two radiator circuits. Thanks to splitting, we have shorter supply and return circuits. However, in this case, not only the radiators need to be balanced, but also the distribution manifold of the radiator circuits must be balanced. Because in practice, 
it almost never happens that both pipes are exactly the same and have the same hydraulic resistance. Thanks to this connection, our heaters will heat up much better, even those located the farthest. However, despite everything, it's not worth expecting them to operate at 100% of their heat power. The third connection scheme, the Tichelmann system. So, let's move directly to the Tichelmann system. Here, traditionally, the supply goes to the last radiator. But what's most interesting is that the return pipe starts from the last radiator. As a result, an interesting system like this is created. In it, the main supply and return pipes have a diameter of 25 mm and the radiator pipes are 20 mm. Let's look at how our heating system will work with this connection layout. From the boiler, the coolant enters the first radiator and from this radiator, the return flow begins. So, it turns out that this heater is first in supply and ninth in return. Thus, this heater has the strongest flow and the weakest return. Then, the coolant moves to the next radiator. It heats it up completely and it turns out that this is the second radiator on the supply side and the eighth on the return. If we compare this heater with the previous one, we have slightly worse supply in it, but the return is slightly better. So after starting the whole system, let's take a look at this radiator. It's the ninth on the supply side and the first on the return. In such a setup, it turns out that this radiator has the weakest supply but the strongest return flow because that radiator is the closest to the boiler on the return line. And this radiator, if we look, is the eighth on the supply and second on the return. With such a connection of radiators to the heating system, we no longer have to balance the radiators themselves, even if all radiators and valves are open. All radiators will operate at 100% anyway, and all will heat up equally well. It's precisely with this connection that all radiators operate completely independently. If we decide to decrease the power of one of the heaters, or conversely increase it, it doesn't matter where the heater is located. Further away from the boiler, at the beginning of the supply, or at the end of the return flow. It also has absolutely no impact on the operation of the other radiators. If they were heating at 100% before, they will continue to heat at 100% of their thermal power. The coolant doesn't have to reach the radiator and then return in the opposite direction. It continues in the same direction. And from a hydraulic point of view, that's a big plus. It's about the pipes from the boiler to the radiator and back forming a ring. Thus, the total length of the supply and return pipes is roughly the same for each radiator. This means that all radiators are subject to roughly the same pressure losses and therefore the same volume flow, which is equal to the same heat flow in radiators. This leads to an even heating of the radiators even those further away from the boiler. To make it clearer, imagine it's like traffic flow. It's like a bypass with no lights and no 180 degree turns. There is no need to regulate the flow, as it regulates itself. With all these benefits, there's one small downside to this arrangement. It turns out that on one side we have strong supply, and on the other side we have strong return. Somewhere in the middle, where a strong return becomes strong supply, there apparently occurs a balance of forces. If a radiator installation falls in that spot, the radiator there won't work. In practice, this is a very rare occurrence. However, if it happens that the radiator doesn't heat up, this issue can be very easily resolved. It is necessary to move the heater to the right or left by literally one meter. If the radiator cannot be moved, we will need to extend the pipe before or after the radiator. It doesn't matter whether it's on the supply or return side, you can make such a loop. After this action, the heater will heat up just like all the others. We have tested it in practice. The installation diagram above the door. Later in this video, we'll take a closer look at longer and more complex diagrams based on this system. Knowing the basics and sketching out a small system, for example, four radiators, we can easily create more complex setups. And what should be done during heating installation if we have an obstacle, for instance, doors? How do we get around these doors? The easiest way to bypass them is from the top. Great option. The only downside is that air might accumulate here. An automatic air vent will need to be placed here. But will our client like all this? 
probably not going to be happy. Moreover, this automatic air vent may leak from time to time. The client won't like it either. Another option is to lay the pipes under the doors. In this case, there's no risk of exposure to air, but it's not always possible. Let's say the floor or concrete screed has been laid, but it's heavily reinforced and just can't be penetrated. Then, this option may not work. So, the remaining option is a roundabout way, quite a maneuver. That is, we lay the pipes not above or under the doors, but we loop here. We go along the wall and return to the boiler. So this option has a right to exist. A two-story layout. Now, let's think about how to apply the Tischelmann system to two floors at the same time. Moreover, not every floor separately, but in such a way that the entire system, all two floors, are connected in one layout. See, from the boiler comes a supply pipe, it goes up, completely wraps the second floor all the second floor heaters. It goes off somewhere in the corner, brushing against all the radiators on the first floor, reaching the two extreme ones, namely the penultimate and the last. This is where it ends. There are only two thin pipes here running from it to the radiators. The same applies to the return pipe. Enters the first floor, wraps around the entire first floor, along all the radiators of the first floor, and in the same corner, subtly rises in the opposite direction. Then, the pipe bypasses all the radiators on the second floor, reaches the two extreme radiators, and ends here. They are connected with thin pipes. Two pipe for three floors. Now we're going to make the task even more difficult. Each of our floors will be connected according to the same Tischelmann system. Each floor has a separate heating system. And within this floor, within this heating system, all the radiators are connected according to the Tichelmann system layout. So it turns out that the first floor is closest to the return, like in this case, but farthest from the power source. The top floor is closest to the supply and farthest from the return. And the middle floor is in average conditions. This means that each of the floors operates under the same conditions. The same streams come through their heating systems. Besides, on each floor, each of the radiators is also connected according to the Tickleman system, and each radiator operates under equal conditions. Which means it's completely perfect. Even so, here's a piece of advice. If possible, each floor should be connected using a separate pipe with a separate circulation pump. I showed this diagram to explain what capabilities such a system has. But if you have one pump for all three floors and it fails, the whole house will cool down. However, if there's a separate pump on each floor, it's convenient for the customer. It can shut off a floor by simply turning off the pump. If a pump on a specific floor suddenly breaks down, another floor will heat up and the whole house won't cool down. In the same way, when we have several pumps, we can control the temperature using different sensors and a temperature switch. That's all I wanted to say. If you want to add anything, I'm waiting for comments. Thank you.